I think uh, we'll begin at this point. I'm Laura Lane at the School of Social Work, University of Michigan, and I want to welcome you to this webinar on income support, how can basic income and child allowances reduce extreme economic inequality. I know that uh, many of you joining us are going to be receiving CEUs, continuing education units for this uh, event. And I'd like to bring Leah Wessela on to tell us how to do that. Hi everyone. Um, if you are wanting continuing education for today's session, I just wanna set you up for success with us today. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that you're staying for the duration of today's session. So. That's the first thing you need to do. Um, we also, because this is a live interactive session, we're going to be having um, some interactive polling throughout today's session. So all you need to do is make sure that you respond to each poll as it pops up on your screen. The polls are going to be happening through Zoom. Um, we do notice that sometimes folks don't have the, the, the poll function working on their Zoom. So if that's the case, please feel free to respond to the question in the chat instead. Um, but we ask you to try to do the poll first if, it, if you can, um, and if not, the chat is fine. Speaking of the chat, the chat function will be available today if you have anything that you want to chime in about. Um, our panelists are able to see the chat. Uh, we do have a question and answer section also here in Zoom, and so if you have any specific questions that you want directed to the presenters, please be sure to use that so we don't lose your question in the chat stream. I would also like to alert you to the fact that there is a live transcript that is currently running. You have the option to turn that on or off as suits your preference and needs. Um, so please, uh, you can click on live transcript on the menu at the bottom and turn that either on or off. Um, and really, if you have any questions pertaining to continuing education, I will be here. And if you address them to me in the chat, I can respond to them there. And if not, I will be putting my contact information in the chat so you can reach me at a later time. So without further ado, um, I look forward to hearing from you through the polls. Um, I'm gonna pass this over to our wonderful presenters who are going to be uh, running the session today. Okay. And um, I think before we uh, do that, we have our first question on the poll. Those of you uh, seeking continuing education units, if you could please uh, answer. Everyone is welcome to respond to the polls. You don't have to be a <laughs> wanting CE. We want to hear from the whole audience. Okay. All right, we got some responses coming in. Give it another moment. Got most of our participants responding. Again, if you cannot use the poll for some reason with your uh, setup you have with your system, please feel free to respond in the chat. All right, I'm gonna end our poll. Share the results so we can see who's in the room. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is a project of the Grand Challenges for Social Work, which are looking to uh, harness the social work knowledge base, research, and practice experience uh, to work together on some of the toughest problems facing our society. There are 13 grand challenges, and this webinar is sponsored by the Grand Challenge to Reduce Economic Inequality. And in particular, our team is looking uh, to solutions to what kinds of policies and practices can be put in place to address economic inequality. And you're going to be looking today at guaranteed incomes of various sorts, including child allowances, and programs that provide different targeted groups with guaranteed incomes. And to bring us forward in that, I'd like to introduce Dylan Belisle, who will be moderating these sessions. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And after working as a community service organizer in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, he returned to school and has continued studying the ways in which the EITC and other programs are used by families in poverty. Dylan, it's over to you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, so I'll just provide a short introduction. Um, 
So as social workers, we know that income poverty and economic hardship limits the ability uh, for individuals, families, and communities to uh, thrive and maintain positive health and general well-being. Um, we're also well aware of how child poverty and material hardship in particular can adversely impact children's, um, sorry, my screen just changed. Let me change this. To children's um, physical and emotional um, and, and cognitive well-being, uh, which can lead to poor educational attainment, low earnings, higher chances of um, health outcome, um, adverse health outcomes as adults. Um, so growing economic inequality, precarious employment, and income volatility have further raised concerns about the rising levels of material deprivation, particularly among children, and the impact it has on society as a whole. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In the recent decade, universal basic income and guaranteed income have reemerged as policies to address these, these economic challenges. Um, so today's panel of scholars, practitioners, and advocates will explore how unconditional recurring cash benefits, often referred to as basic income, can reduce material hardship by providing reliable income source that individuals and families can use to cover their basic expenses and reduce hardships. Um, so as sort of alluded to, um, the webinar is divided into three parts. Uh, the first part of the webinar, we will hear about the problem of economic inequality in, in the United States and how policies like basic income and child allowances can help address these problems. And we'll also hear about why social workers like ourselves should care about basic income and the differences between basic income and guaranteed income. In the second part of the webinar, we will learn uh, more about the current context of basic income programs in the United States their impact and how these programs can help us work towards broader system change. This part will also include a discussion of how three panelists see basic income and guaranteed income impacting problems like poverty and racial and gender inequality. And then we'll end the webinar by, by bringing together all of our panelists for, um, for the Q&A, where we hope to engage with uh, you all, the audience, um, therefore, as the webinar proceeds, um, feel free to submit your questions um, through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we look forward to hearing more about your own thoughts about our discussion. Um, so now we will start the first part of our webinar, where we will hear from Dr. Luke Schaefer and Dr. Michael Lewis. Dr. Luke Schaefer is a professor of social work and public policy at the University of Michigan. He is the director of uh, the University of Michigan's Poverty Solutions, where he works with communities and policymakers on new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And Dr. Michael Lewis is a professor of social work at the CUNY Silberman uh, School of Social Work. He's an expert on basic income and draws on his background in applied statistics to explore economic inequality and other social problems, including health inequity and poverty. Um, but before um, we proceed, I believe we have a, a question for the audience. Is there a poll? Maybe, yes. Oh, here we go. All right. So you should see a poll. Take a moment to get your responses. All right, should we? See how the results come. All right. So it looks like um, folks are seeing um, issue of economic inequality emerge a lot more since the pandemic. Um, well, great. Well, with that, um, I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Luke Schaefer. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you from Ann Arbor uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects. And we might start a conversation. Uh, my role is to really try to start at the high level of 
why would we intervene with something like basic income or guaranteed income or negative income tax or a child allowance? We might start with an adage from uh, what some people might consider a classic movie at this point, show me the money. The argument is that it's better to provide families or we do better by families. Uh, I don't need the slides up at this stage. I'll let you know when I need the slides. We might do better to provide families cash rather than in-kind aid. In-kind aid might be food assistance like SNAP, formerly the food stamp program or a housing voucher or a bus token, right? Or a voucher to the grocery store. Maybe we help families better by giving them the money. Maybe sometimes we help families better by giving them money instead of giving them services. Uh, a budgeting class or uh, a cooking class. Um, and so this principle, like this idea basically starts with four core ideas in my mind, the argument for this. When we think about providing aid in cash rather than something else, we're often thinking about the flexibility. We're thinking about empowerment. We're thinking about simplicity. And we're thinking about efficiency. So flexibility and empowerment. The idea behind giving people cash is that families are the closest to their challenges and families' lives are, com are complex, right? Some families might have real trouble getting food while others might be close to a food pantry, right? And be able to get food. The first family might not have as much trouble getting housing. The second family might have a lot of trouble getting housing. We don't know what families are struggling with. Some families might be struggling with debt, right? Some families might um, have their wages garnished or their driver's license has been suspended and they'd like to get that back. And Cash says, you know, we as government, we as sort of an apparatus or we as a social service agency, we don't know what you're struggling with as well as you do. So rather than saying, we're gonna give you this thing that we think is gonna meet the need that we think you have, even though we don't know as much about your life as we'd like, we're gonna give you the money. And the family then gets to say, I'm gonna use this money. I am empowered to use this money for food or I am empowered to use it for my rent or I could use it to pay down back debt or I could use it to try to get my driver's license back. So flexibility and empowerment. And in that empowerment, sometimes we reduce the stigma, right? Sometimes when you provide an in-kind type of aid, it says, it sort of signals, we don't think you know what is best for you or we don't think you're gonna spend the money in the right way. And Cash says, we are going to trust you. And some families, they might, um, you know, uh, some people might worry that people will use the money in the wrong way. And when we do provide cash, we can't be sure of that. But we have evidence after evidence, actually, that as cash transfers go in, sometimes things like alcohol and substance abuse, those things actually go down rather than going up. Because sometimes, like substance use is a response to stress. And one way to really relieve stress is to relieve financial pressure. So flexibility, empowerment, we're gonna trust families and we're gonna give them the freedom to decide how they wanna use the money. Number three is simplicity, right? Whenever we provide a housing voucher, whenever we provide some sort of token, right? There are some costs involved in that. We have to arrange for that. We have to monitor that it gets used in the way it should. We have to make sure landlords are doing what they should. And cash tries to strip as much of that away and say, we're just gonna have a transaction, especially a guaranteed income type thing, right? Where we're not means testing. Means testing, and by that I mean making sure somebody really deserves the money. Um, that takes a lot of resources. And instead of spending money trying to make sure people only use this benefit for food or they only use it, we provide a service, we're just gonna sort of cash it out as it were and give people the money. It can, it's not simple, but it's far more simple than a lot of the other options available for it to us. And in that way, it's very efficient. It uh, costs us less money. We don't have to go to that work of negotiating with landlords, setting up regulations, figuring out how the landlords are getting around that. We don't have to go about the work of making sure that people who are on food assistance aren't selling their SNAP so that they can buy underwear, right? Which currently is illegal. We can strip all of that away and get more of the resources in this program directly tied to helping families get it right into their pockets. 
So one of the interesting things about using cash to help families, to show families the money, is politically it crosses the typical lines, right? We think we hear a lot about how sides are divided and and you know there's just you know there's maybe a right or a left and never the twain shall meet. Well, cash transfers actually they paint a bit of a different picture. You have interesting people from both the right and the left um, coming forward saying, you know what, maybe cash transfers is the way to go. Uh, you have Milton Friedman, a great libertarian. Uh, you have folks from the Cato Institute. Uh, you have a social work luminary like Michael Lewis, who we're going to hear from today. Um, poverty scholars like Robert Lampton, Andy Stern, who ran the SEIU. So it really sort of crosses these divides that sometimes we think are intractable in really, really interesting ways. Now, uh, in the United States, we have recently had sort of an explosion in experience with cash transfers. So think for a second about uh, recent months. What are some of the types of policies that the federal government um, has pursued that uh, fit into this cash transfer and particularly actually this sort of universal, more universal approach where we're not going to sort of income test to people who are extremely poor. You might think of unemployment insurance. We've done this historical thing with unemployment insurance where not only did we expand eligibility for that program, but we also increased the benefits that people got. We've had stimulus checks where uh, we said, Virtually all Americans, something like 90% of Americans, whether you're extremely poor or middle class or even upper middle class, are we gonna receive these cash transfers at various parts during the, um, you know, once in the spring, once in December, once uh, recently in this spring. Um, and they can use that money as they see fit, right? To, to meet their basic needs or save or uh, put money away for college. As we never have done anything like either of those two type programs. Uh, those were both temporary measures, right? Those were things that were actually done in a bipartisan fashion. Think about these, this unprecedented expansion of unemployment insurance. It was done during an unusual time, but was also passed by a divided Congress and a Republican president. And um, they were all in response to this particular moment in history, right? This cataclysmic uh, economic crisis that uh, combined with the public health crisis, where a lot of the issues, as our poll suggests, showed uh, inequality really on people's minds. The, another addition to that has been the uh, expanded child tax credit. That's something that I've been working on for a long time. And it builds on models in other countries called a, a universal child allowance. And the principles behind that are very simple. They say raising kids is expensive and the government has a reason to support parents in that work and money can help. We're gonna empower families. We're gonna trust them by providing a cash transfer to do right by their families and their children. And we're gonna do it in a universal way by saying not just the extremely poor but also middle and even upper middle-class families are gonna receive the same benefit. Everybody's gonna receive it. So of course, I. Couldn't leave you today without doing uh, one chart. So uh, Dominique, if you don't mind putting up the first chart that you see in my slides. We have been blessed since the onset of COVID with um, a Census Bureau survey that's giving us real time data on how families are doing. And we can see every few weeks, right? We're asking questions about, um, are you having trouble putting food on the table? Are you uh, having trouble meeting your essential expenses? And here's a chart. If you follow it uh, from the start of the chart, you can see we're starting in August 20th. And there was a very long period where the, the, the government wasn't doing as much in terms of cash transfers during the fall of 2020. There was a big spurt in the spring of 2020. And then we waited for a while, you know, basically to see what was gonna happen in the election during the fall. This is a response to a question, do you sometimes or often not have enough food in the past seven days? You can see during this economic crisis, while the government wasn't doing things, that inches up. And the top line is families with kids, the middle line is all families, and the, and the bottom line is families without kids. Then there's stimulus checks that go out in December 2020, and you can see immediately this rate of hardship drops, and then it stays stable starting in January, February, and March. And then we did another stimulus check uh, through the American Rescue Plan. And again, food hardship drops. So it comes to its um, 
lowest point recorded point during the pandemic and maybe one of the lowest rates we've ever had. And finally, we have the first child tax credit that goes into effect. Uh, we see the first payments in July. And here, this is the exciting thing for us researchers, that the percent of uh, families with kids who are experiencing food insufficiency drops 25%. That's an astounding number right there. And really, there's not much drop at all among those without. So we start to see just this wealth of data that when the government acts, using the flexibility, the empowerment, the efficiency, we we're able to get these stimulus checks out very quickly, we see that families do better. And so the big question is, what do we, where do we go from here? The child tax credit is in, one, in for one year, but we hope that it will be made permanent or will be extended. But there's lots of other things to think about and talk about, about how we might structure cash transfers, basic income, or uh, guaranteed income. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to the one and only Michael Lewis. Uh, thanks. Um, I'll start up. Uh, first, I want to say I, uh, I met Luke for the first time, I think, about five or six years ago, I think, something like that. Um, but I'd known of his work for a long time before that. And I knew that he worked on child allowances, things like that. So the first thing I want to say is congratulations. <laughs> um, uh, it finally happened. Uh, it's only temporary right now, I think. Uh, there are people trying to make it permanent, as I understand it. Um, but um, a lot of years of work, uh, at least appears to have paid off for the time being. So. Thank you. Congrats I did. That. I did have a week of a dance party, a private dance party <laughs> in my house when, I, when it went into effect. So congrats on that. Um, what I'm going to do, what I've been asked to do, is really focus on two things. One is why social workers should care about all this stuff about cash transfers, basic income, guaranteed income, things like that. And then the second thing is talk about some important distinctions that come up in discussions, debates, and commentary on cash transfers. Uh, so why social workers should care, and then what are some important distinctions? Um, and I'll do that. Um, I may have a table at the end to go into detail about one of these distinctions, but if not, um, I can leave it with um, maybe someone to make it available in some other way. Um, but I'll start with uh, why should social workers care? Um, and when I think about this question, I, I think there are really um, at least two reasons, um, two reasons. Uh, one having to do with social workers uh, claimed commitments to, to self-determination. Uh, another word for that is freedom. Um, but we tend to use the word self-determination. So that's one reason, I think. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And the other reason is because of our claim to be interested in promoting equity and social justice. Um, uh, our, our code of ethics uh, has these two things in it, uh, in ASW code of ethics. Um, if you don't feel governed by that as a social worker, uh, maybe not all of us do, um, but many of us, even if we don't feel governed by that, we do claim to care about self-determination and, and also uh, social justice. Um, that's relevant because a lot of the arguments that are made either in favor of basic income or in opposition to basic income, um, there are people like that too. Uh, a lot of the arguments made for and against basic income draw on notions of freedom and liberty or what we tend to call self-determination. So, so many of the, 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 the debates or the positions taken on this topic um, and what I said about basic income uh, covers cash transfers in general. Um, uh, Luke talked about uh, vouchers and things like that versus cash. Uh, one argument for cash is that it frees people up to make choices that they think are best for themselves and their families, as opposed to having government do that for them. And some folks are for that freedom, some folks are not. Um, so my point is that freedom or self-determination comes up a lot in debates on, on basic income, guaranteed income, cash transfers. And as a profession who claims to care about that value, uh, I think that that 
those debates, those discussions are quite relevant to, to our profession. Um, also, a lot of debates, um, a, lot of, a lot of arguments for and against basic income also, and cash transfers in general, um, also draw on notions of social justice. Um, some people think that guaranteed income, basic income, things like that would promote social justice, um, would promote equity and fairness. Uh, some think that they would actually curtail equity and justice. Uh, so my point is that not that one of those sides are right. Well, I think one of the side, those sides are right, but I'll, I'll, that's for another discussion. <laughs> um, but my point here is not which one is right. My point is just that, that the value of social justice um, comes up so much in discussions of basic income, cash transfers, guaranteed income, that is a profession, as a profession that, that as a profession that claims to care about social justice, I think we should, or it, it behooves us to be involved in these debates, I think, at least follow them, take positions, because they're talking about our bread and butter, so to speak. Um, so I think those are, are two reasons that social workers ought to care about uh, income support policies, cash transfers, things like that. Um, let me now move into the, the distinctions. Um, and again, these are distinctions that, that come up a lot in discussions, debates, commentary, written, verbal, whatever, about uh, cash transfers, basic income, guaranteed, guaranteed income, things like that. So this is really more like just me giving definitions in a sense uh, to like capture these distinctions. Um, so one distinction that comes up a lot and Luke uh, mentioned this uh, implicitly, um, is the distinction between cash benefits versus in-kind benefits. benefits. Um, I'll start with in-kind benefits and then cash benefits afterwards. Uh, so in-kind benefits, uh, I-N uh, hyphen kind, K-I-N-D, uh, these kinds of benefits are those you can think of as basically restricting the, the, the nature of the benefits or the form of the benefits restrict what the recipient can use them for, right? So there, so there are restrictions or constraints on how beneficiaries can use those benefits. One example is what used to be called food stamps when I was a kid, but now called SNAP for I think supplemental security, supplemental nutritional assistance program, something like that, um, but SNAP. And this is a benefit that ostensibly goes to people to help them buy certain kinds of food. And in, in, in theory, uh, legally, they're not supposed to use those benefits to buy anything but certain kinds of food, not even all foods, but certain types of foods. Um, but as Luke alluded to, uh, some people get around that uh, by in effect selling their SNAP benefits uh, for cash uh, to use on other things. Um, and again, people like that. Some like the fact that that happens, some don't. Um, but, but the benefit is meant to be used only on food. Um, another in-kind benefit would be a housing voucher. Um, so let's say Section 8 housing, where you get a voucher that goes to landlords, uh, the government uh, pays part of your rent uh, through the voucher's plan, and you pay for the rest of it through your own income. That's in-kind. A cash benefit example would be something like uh, temporary assistance for needy families, sometimes called TANF, uh, more commonly called welfare. Um, that's money you get from the government and you can use that money as a recipient to buy whatever you want. So, so that's an important distinction. Uh, cash versus in-kind, uh, guaranteed incomes, basic incomes, other cash transfer programs, uh, they're called cash transfer programs for a reason. Uh, those are all uh, typically um, cash programs. Um, so that's one distinction that's important. Another distinction is that between means tested benefits and non means tested benefits. Um, I've seen a third distinction. Some make a distinction between means tested, income tested, and non means tested or income tested. That's to me, needlessly complicated and not very common. Uh, the more common distinction is between means-tested benefits versus non-means-tested benefits. And non-means-tested benefits are sometimes called universal benefits, sometimes. Um, a means-tested benefit is one where in order to qualify for that benefit, 
a person's or a family's income plus assets must be below a certain level. Um, so your income plus assets, income or assets, must be below a certain level to qualify for the benefit. Um, so you have to be poor or near poor or have an income with no more than some multiple of the poverty line. But it's, there's a threshold, a cutoff. And those above that threshold don't get the benefits and those below it do. That's means tested. Uh, Non-means tested or universal is a benefit that doesn't have any kind of income or asset threshold. Uh, so rich can qualify, middle class can qualify, poor folks can qualify, at least in a gross sense. Um, that's a qualification I'm gonna come back to, um, at least in a gross sense. Uh, everyone qualifies uh, for those universal benefits. So that's another, another important distinction. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is work conditioned versus non-work conditioned benefits. Um, this is probably what it sounds like, um, but I want to quickly add that when I use the term work in this context, I'm talking about people selling their labor in the formal job market. Um, work is a term that's used sometimes only to refer to that, uh, but people do a lot of work that doesn't involve selling labor in the job market. Um, so when I use the term work, I'm only talking about that selling labor kind, although I realize that work goes beyond that. I get that. Um, I have a 19 year old um, and it took a lot of work to get her to 19. Um, and it's still taking work now that she's still, even though she's still 19, she's 19, still work, um, but I wasn't paid for it. Um, so I get that. Uh, so by work condition benefits, I mean uh, those that require people either to work in order to receive the benefit. Uh, an example of that is the earned income tax credit that Luke mentioned, um, or people are required to have a record of work, um, a history of work to receive the benefit. An example of that would be social security. Um, another one would be unemployment insurance. So either you have to work to get the benefit or you have to have, you have, to have a record of having work to get the benefit. That's work conditioned. Um, Non-work non conditioned benefits are those where that's not a requirement. Um, so an example of that, uh, might be, let me think, uh, it's hard to think of, <laughs> um, uh, WIC, I guess. Uh, that's the Women, Infants, and Children Program. Um, as I understand it, there's no work condition there um, to get the benefit. Um, there are other conditions, but not a work condition. Um, so and that's the way you, where women, uh, either pregnant women or women with young kids get benefits from the government, usually in-kind benefits. Um, another distinction is that between well, first, I want to talk about tax credits and then distinguish between non-refundable tax credits and, refu and refundable ones. Um, so tax, as, as all of us probably know, um, if you make a certain amount of money, you owe the government money um, in the form of an income tax. And sometimes you are entitled to a tax credit. And what a tax credit does is basically decrease the amount you owe in taxes, right? It decreases the amount you, know, you owe in taxes. So let's say you have an income of whatever it is, uh, you do your taxes, you owe $2,000. If you have a $1,000 tax credit, you only have to give the government $1,000, not $2,000, because you have a tax credit of $1,000. That's a tax credit. And, and um, it's important to distinguish between two kinds of tax credits, uh, because that comes up a lot in the guaranteed income versus basic income distinction. Right, so tax credits can be non-refundable or refundable. A non-refundable tax credit is one where you only get it if you actually owe taxes to the government, right? So, so you have an income, you figure out your taxes, you or your accountant does, and you owe some amount of money, amount of money to the government, you get a tax credit, right? And again, that just reduces the taxes you owe based on the value of the credit. Um, that's non-refundable. Uh, some tax credits can be refundable. And those are ones where not only do people who pay taxes benefit, but those who owe tax, those who don't owe taxes, they also benefit. Um, and so take someone who has no earned income at all and therefore owe no taxes, if they are entitled to a refundable $1,000 credit, uh, they would get $1,000 from the government. 
right? The person who has income and owes taxes, they would pay their gross tax bill minus $1,000. Someone with no earned income, they get $1,000. So that's a refundable tax credit. Um, Dr. Lewis, let me just remind you, I have about one more minute. Oh boy, I, I, oh boy. All right, so, um, so, so let me um, talk about um, uh, the distinction between a basic income and a negative income tax. Um, and basically a basic income is money that goes to everyone, right? So you, so whether you're rich, poor or not, you get a certain amount of money, uh, no questions asked, and you pay taxes on any other earned income. So everyone gets it, rich, poor, not, and taxes are paid on earned income. Um, a guaranteed income, sometimes called a negative income tax, is where only those people who owe less in taxes than the value of the income guarantee gets benefits. Uh, so in both cases, basic income and guaranteed income, there's some minimum income that people get. But in basic income, everyone gets it and then pay taxes on their other income. Under guaranteed income, only those people who owe less in taxes than the value of the minimum, they get it. Um, so in a sense, basic income is universal and a guaranteed income or negative income tax is means tested and provided usually through a refundable tax credit. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, presentations were very informative and I look forward to bringing you back um, for a conversation um, at the end of the webinar. Um, so yeah, so now we will turn to the second part of our webinar to learn more about current basic income and guaranteed income programs and pilots that are happening in the United States. Um, and, the, and then the panelists will have a discussion about the promise of basic income um, as a large scale policy sort of going into more details about um, what Dr. Lewis was just um, describing. Um, so we are excited to have um, Dr. Dr. Aisha Mandioro and uh, Joan Hunt and Dr. Leah Hamilton with, with us. Dr. Aisha Nandoro is the Chief Executive uh, Officer of uh, Springboard to Opportunities and the founder of Magnolia Mothers Trust, which is an ongoing guaranteed program, um, guaranteed income program that provides monthly income to Black mothers living in extreme poverty in Mississippi. Joan Hunt is a licensed social worker and executive director of the Greater Hudson Promise neighborhood and the director of the Hudson UBI pilot, which is providing a randomly selected group of residents in Hudson, New York, $500 per month. And Dr. Leah Hamilton is a, an associate professor in, um, in the Department of Social Work at Appalachian State University, where she leads research on economic justice and basic income. So um, Dr. Dr. Sorry, I keep stuttering. Nandora will uh, will kick us off. Thank you. And, and before we um, go, oh to yeah, our sorry, I have I... one question. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, so we have a poll question that should pop up on your screen. And we have one more once everyone is done. All right. Poll ended. We're going to go to the fourth one. Okay, so quite a few uh, few know about uh, child allowances. All right. 
Are we ready? Yes, we are. All right, great. Thank you so much. And that was a very insightful poll. So thank you for that as well, Dominique. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I come from a family of social workers. I'm not a social worker by training, but I know firsthand that people who go into social work don't do it for the money. Um, you don't do it for big paychecks. You do it because you want to help people. And unfortunately, I think many of you also know firsthand that many of our social safety net programs that we have relied on for years in this country are not actually designed to help people. They're designed to punish them punish them for being poor or being single or being black or God forbid all three. So my work is first twofold. First, I work to advance programs that help people. And second, I'm committed to dismantling the harmful narratives around deservingness and dignity that have harmed far too many of us for too long. Um, as it was stated when reading my bio, I run the Magnolia Mothers Trust. It is a guaranteed income project that we have been running since 2018 that centers the needs of extremely low income black women into the conversation around deservingness, the conversations around dignity and the conversations around cash disbursements without restrictions. When Michael was talking he went, um, he talked in significant details about vouchers and TANF and SNAP and all of the different ways in which this country in which we have gone about supporting extremely low income individuals. But the failure with all of those programs in a lot of instances is that baked into the designs of those programs is this in inherent need to have to prove that you deserve the benefits. You have to prove that you are poor enough to actually need support. So just take a step back and think about that for a moment. You are a parent, you are a mother, you are a father, and you are trying to support your family. And every month, or quarterly or whatever the time frame is, you have to go to a caseworker and you have to prove that you are still poor enough to need support. Think about the trauma wrapped into that system. Think about having to verbalize to individuals that you are not able to successfully care for your family. Think about how you may begin to feel as if you are failing in some regard. So baked into our system, the way it's currently designed is trauma. It's, in, it's, indign it's not dignifying. It takes away your ability to have agency. And so when we started the Magnolia Mothers Trust, we said we're going to push back against all of that. We're going to push back against the harm for narratives that individuals are poor because they choose to be poor and recognize that individuals are poor because our systems, our social safety net are designed in a way that they do not see individuals, they do not humanize individuals, and they do not trust individuals. So just to give you a little bit about what our program is, um, we were the first guaranteed in Income project in this nation to explicitly call out the racial and gender injustices that currently exist. We provide $1,000 a month for 12 months to extremely low income Black mothers that live in federally subsidized affordable housing. That's $12,000. On average, the families that we work with make $11,000 annually. So inherently, we are doubling their income. And before we have a conversation about deservingness and people working and not working, I'm just going to tell y'all, the folks that we work with are actually working. In Mississippi, our federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. $7.25 an hour. These are individuals who are home health aides. They are child care providers. They are your essential workers, but we are not paying them since they are essential. So with the Magnolia Mothers Trust, we are in essence doubling their income, but we also are investing in, the, in their children's futures. We see the accounts for each one of our mothers. We see the thousand dollars in a child savings account for their kids, um, making sure that we are building into opportunities for them to begin to think about whatever it is that they want to do when they grow up. Uh, we are centered in Jackson, Mississippi. And for so many individuals, when we started this program, they were shocked that we would be intentional in our approach. They were shocked that we would be intentional about calling out a lot of the harmful narratives. But when we started, we were first. So I was like, you know what? If we're going to do it, we're going to go big. And we're just going to name the things that need to be named. Um, and we've done that successfully since 2018. And one of the things that we were really intentional about is we wanted to challenge the structures that hold Black women back in this country particularly poor Black women in the Deep South, stereotypes around work ethic, the paternalistic nature of our social safety net, who is deserving of help and dignity. We have a research component of our work, but I don't need an evaluation to tell you that cash helps people. Think about for those of us who are who received the stimulus check, or if you received the child tax credit starting in July, did that cash help? 
I'm sure it did. Um, and so it's just common sense. But so many times we believe that what's good for one is not good for the other. And that goes back to the moralism and the deservedness that we associate with poverty. Um, and we need to get to places where we begin to view it at a different lens and view it for the harmful, the harmful stance in which it actually is. So, and so with the Magnolia Mothers Trust has always been about building a movement, empowering Black women, and unapologetically positioning them as worthy, capable, and valuable. Um, and you know, when we talk about guaranteed income for so many individuals, we have the tendency to focus on the economic impact. I am not going to go into all of our statistics around our evaluation of what it is that individuals have done with their money. You can definitely go to our website at Springboard to Opportunities and see all of that. But I want to have a different conversation. I think so many times, what we have learned in doing this work um, that so many times we just talk about the capitalism that folks are able to engage and we talk about the consumer sovereignty and that's important but for us what we have learned since doing this work for the last two years uh, is that we are seeing that individuals are able to show up with joy they're flipping the script shifting the narrative shifting the story um, about what's possible for themselves and their families and that's where we get to sustainability to me that is the most beautiful aspect of our work is that women are able to see themselves for the first time and they're able to see themselves in a way that they have never seen themselves before they're actually able to dream about the future i'll tell you a story um one of our moms whom I've known for years. Whenever I would ask her what it was that she wanted for herself, she would never tell me what she wanted for herself. She would always talk about what she wanted for her kids because she told me that she actually didn't see a future where she existed. And so the most important thing for her was to make sure that her kids are okay. Well, she became one of our Magnolia Mothers Trust Women in 2020. And when I asked her a few months after getting her first check, had she decided differently about what she wanted for her future and did she actually have a future now where she saw herself in it and she said yeah she's like i think i want to be a paramedic we need paramedics now and that is the power of cash it allows you the ability to have dignity it allows you the ability to have agency and it allows you to have ability to actually think about a future for yourself not just your kids and i'll pause there so that we can go to joan so then we can get to questions thank you all so much Wow, thank you so much, Aisha. Let's, I just get chills hearing you speak about your work and <laughs> we feel like we're coming in years later um, into the work here in Hudson. But so my name is Joan. Um, I'm the pilot director for Hudson Up. We are on paper a universal basic income pilot, um, but to some of Aisha's points, we obviously understand the complex racial disproportionality and economic injustice that many of many of our community members here in Hudson face. So while we are, you know, somewhat of a random lottery, uh, we did weight that lottery using the Opportunity Atlas data set to understand that there are members of our community that are at a disadvantage. And so we, in essence, gave them uh, disadvantaged members of our community based on um, gender and racial demographics, more of a chance of getting selected for our lottery. Um, so we do have 25 participants here in our Hudson Up pilot. Um, they're receiving $500 a month for five years. We are, I think, one of the longest running pilots in terms of how long participants will be receiving um, the UBI payments. And we are now getting ready to launch our second cohort of um, up to 50 participants, which would be increasing you know, significantly the number of people. And they would be entering in for another five years. Um, into the pilot. And so just to talk a little bit about, you know, what it took to kind of get this pilot off the ground here in Hudson, um, we are a small city of about 6,000, a little under 6,000 residents and a very complex and tight knit community. And so bringing in something like UBI initially was uh, very alarming for many community members, uh, a lot of mistrust, of course, into something that sounds so good, you know, like you're going to give me $500 a month of unrestricted, and I don't have to do anything for it. So there was a lot of on the ground outreach um, that had to happen, you know, forming relationships with other organizations on the ground in the community, you know, hiring community members to help with the outreach to get the word out there, setting up tables and doing very direct one on one outreach really to just get the word out about the program and that it was a real, a real thing. 
Um, and then of course there's the um, notification to participants, which is it, I was the lucky one to actually make the phone calls to the 25 participants that were selected. And even in that process, there was still a lot of reassurance and um, you know, just <laughs> Uh, proving to folks that this was a real thing and not a scam and that, you know, they would in fact be receiving this money for the next five years. And then there's the onboarding, the orientation and the onboarding, which includes a lot of what we haven't talked about today, but benefits counseling, which is a huge piece of the UBI, BI, GI um, challenge is, is really talking about how this additional money coming in um, potentially could impact someone's benefits that they're already receiving. And it's a whole nother conversation, but a huge challenge to, um, to deal with. But we do our best to work one-on-one -on -one with participants during that process to make sure that um, this does not impact them negatively. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, the research piece, which we're gonna hear more about from Dr. Leah Hamilton, um, and then the storytelling and media, which is so much of the work and getting uh, getting the word out about UBI and, and the narratives of participants and so much of what we've heard today around dignity and freedom and self-determination. Um, I think so much of that shines through beautifully in the stories that we hear um, from participants. So I will now turn it over to Leah to talk a little bit about um, her research and, and what uh, some of the early things that she's found in, in her work here in Hudson. Thanks, Joan. Um, we didn't mention it earlier, but I am the, the PI for the research component of Hudson Up of uh, the 25 participants. I just want to echo something that Aisha said that we know that that basic income works. We know that when people have agency over their own lives, that they that they flourish. Um, so there's there's some basic income researchers who say, is it even ethical to be running pilots? Is it even ethical be, to be doing research because it because it might um, act like this is an open question, whether or not people are capable of making their own choices and whether or not when we give people those choices, their life improves. So the, what we're trying to focus our research in Hudson is that when the awareness that basic income works, GI works, but how do we push that? How do we contribute to the, the, the public narrative? Because there is, people still don't understand how that works. And what, what we believe and what um, I believe in my research is that people need to really uh, deeply understand how this transforms people's lives and they need to be able to think about how it would transform their own lives. So what we're doing that qualitatively, it's, it's a primarily qualitative um, research design. We're looking at the ways that basic income transforms people's health, income assets, family relationships, well-being, employment, and future orientation. And we're finding that um, suddenly people have agency in their life that they didn't feel like they had before. As, as Aisha said, that people can start thinking about what I really wanna do in my life is this, but because they've been on programs before that were income and asset restricted, they didn't have that agency in their life before. So people are launching small businesses. Um, and I also wanna tie it back to something that Luke said that suddenly without that financial strain, people have, I mean, the thing that people tell me overwhelmingly is suddenly I can breathe again. I'm, um, you know, I'm not constantly stressed out about how I'm going to pay my bills. And just that allows people to, to think about their future more. We have five more minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, quickly try to um, ask Aisha and Joan some questions before we open it to the audience. So um, let's jump to both of you. How does this program compare for your participants to true traditional assistance programs? Go ahead, Aisha. <laughs> okay. Um, I, so I think just from what I've heard early on from participants and through the sort of benefits counseling process that I did with each individual was a, around many of the themes we've heard today. So like just, um, the ability to like buy what they want to buy. So like choice and, and the freedom to maybe, you know, go on a vacation for the first time. And I don't know how many years, I mean, this is part of like the, the guaranteed income world that we don't often talk about is like the small luxuries that people are able to now potentially afford because they are not restricted in that way. 
um, you know, paying off debts, going back to school. I mean, we've even in our small group of 25 participants, we've heard so many things um, in a short period of less than a year of what people have been able to do that they could have never have been able to do with other uh, benefits programs. So those are just some some very small examples. But. Aisha, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, same as with Joan. This differs because it's not a subsidy. It's not a voucher. It's cash without restrictions. Individuals do not have to prove to us how they're spending the money. They don't have to show us receipts. They don't have to tell us anything, quite frankly. Um, and so it's very different um, than traditional safety net that most of our families are engaged with. Thank you. So I think we'll have time for this one last question. If guaranteed income or a basic income were to become national policy, what changes would you expect to see? From policymakers or from us? Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, interpret that any way you want, macroeconomic context, in the lives of the average American. But if, you know, that if the hope between pilots is to build for a national policy, of guaranteed income or basic income, what changes would you hope to see nationally or expect to see? So still trying to figure out how to answer that. Um, what I would expect <laughs> to see if this were to become national policy, I'll answer it this way. Um, I hope it would change our ideas of deservedness and I hope it would change the conversations around poverty in this country and that we begin to separate it from an ideal of moralism. And I would hope that it would begin to expand our understanding of collectivism and really understanding that we are all in this together and if you are doing successful i am doing successful i think what we're seeing with the child tax credit is a guaranteed income for individuals with kids um, for the most part so i would expect more opportunities for individuals to live out loud and live a life that's full filled with dreams and us just to actually get to the place where we are a country that is living into this ideal of the American dream that we are still all in love with. And just to add one quick piece to that, it would just be a reduction of the stigma that is associated with so, much, so many of our social service programs. And I think if the pandemic taught us anything, it was that, you know, people now are struggling more than ever and people that may have not been struggling in the past are now in a position where they're reaping the benefits of a, of a guaranteed income. So I think that, yeah, just this a, a significant reduction in the stigma that's attached to many of these programs. Wonderful, thank you. I'll stop there, Dylan, and, and uh, pass the time back to you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, for this. This was this was wonderful. Thank you all for um, coming and 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 sharing your thoughts and so forth. And um, yeah, we've had some questions come in, and uh, one of our first questions I think is always is always a, a very often question that is asked, and it's about how how do we pay for it, right? How do we pay for um, universal basic income? And so um, I'm curious who might be interested in kind of thinking through. Um, you know, as a national policy, what what could this look like? You know, I we do have this model currently with the with the child tax credit, but maybe thinking even beyond that. Um, thoughts on um, what what this might look like in terms of um, yeah the cost as well as the the funding of it. Um, perhaps yeah, Michael, and then okay. uh, Luke. Right? So yeah. Um, so this is another this question is tied to another distinction between guaranteed income and basic income. Um, guaranteed incomes are typically, as I said, refundable tax credits. So they, so it's, it's done through, the main point is done through the tax system. Um, and so typically we're talking about financing through an income tax. Um, and then there are various ways to do that. So it could be a progressive tax. Uh, most people I know of who support a guaranteed income want it that way, a progressive tax where, where people with uh, lower incomes, pay a lower share of their income in taxes than those of more income. Um, but it's an income tax finance system. Um, a basic income could be financed as an income tax, um, but there are other ways of doing that as well that you hear more about. Um, so, so, so guaranteed income, usually, income, usually the ones I've seen, income tax financed, basic income could be that, 
but also people talk about carbon taxes, um, taxes on on uh, like VAT taxes, a kind of sales tax kind of uh, uh, taxes on like wealth taxes. I have a, a friend and colleague, uh, Amal, Amal, Almaz Zalecki, who prefers wealth taxes. Um, so typically people who advocate basic on income, they're thinking of a combination of maybe income, wealth, carbon, other kinds of taxes that I haven't talked about um, to, to pay for it. Um, but, but I don't think um, the problem is getting the revenue. Um, uh, a VAT tax would get a whole lot of money. Um, European countries use VAT taxes a lot, um, but VAT taxes are also what's called uh, regressive, um, although there are ways to make them less regressive. Um, uh, but the main, the main point is that I think there are ways to pay for it, um, especially if you go the basic income route. Um, although there may, be, there may be ways to like finance guaranteed incomes outside of income taxes too, but the, and the ones I've seen by definition, they're income tax finance because they're negative income taxes. Um, and I don't have time to get into why that is, but that's, that's, that's basically the, the idea. I'll just chime in quickly to say that the um, expansion of the child tax credit is, is something that I think we can afford. There's a fairly, um, there is a path towards paying for that sustainably over the future. So it costs about a uh, hundred billion dollars a year. Um, just as a reference point, we spend four four hundred billion dollars a year on Medicaid. So we still spend quite a bit less on uh, income for helping people than we do on uh, healthcare. A uh, hundred billion dollars a year happens to be a fair amount less than uh, the uh, Trump tax cut uh, that was passed a number of years ago. So um, you could simply go back to the taxes that we were paying a few years ago um, to, to be able to make this sort of a, a paid for sustainable path into the future. And many of the other ideas that Michael mentioned are ways that, that people have noted. The only other one that I've heard is things like uh, reducing the home mortgage interest deduction on very large mortgages. It ends up being an incredibly big tax benefit to people who purchase very, very expensive homes. I wanted to just draw out when we're thinking about the cost, this question of basic income or negative income tax, where you do this means testing, you sort of say, all right, we're going to bring everybody up to a certain level. And the guaranteed basic income where everybody gets the benefit and you have to pay um, you know, taxes on top of that. So um, if we do everything through the tax code, that can simplify things. But if, if we do sort of this means tested question, we hear a lot about the issues that our panelists just talk about of the stigma of all the money that's been in trying to figure out, are you poor enough to deserve this benefit? And it also creates animosity um, among people who are just above those thresholds. So you imagine if we set it at the federal poverty line or we set it at 120, you know, just above the federal poverty line, People just a little higher than that are like, hey, I'm really struggling too. Why am I not getting the benefit? And that's really the argument for near universalism. So the child tax credit goes you know, up to about 90% of all kids. It caps out at the very, very top. It sort of decreases at $150,000 and above for uh, families with kids. Everybody else below that level gets the exact same benefit, right? It treats everyone equally. And I think there's a real power in that. And my reading of the evidence is that's why the child tax credit, as well as the stimulus checks, the stimulus checks were also near universal in that regard, were immensely more popular than cash transfers we've done before that really were limited to very poor families. And so before uh, the COVID pandemic, if you had asked me about these things, I would have mentioned that, you know, a lot of Americans don't like providing cash to uh, families who are struggling. And I still think there's some truth to that. But now I have to say with stimulus checks that spent billions of dollars to low income families and the child tax credit that's doing the same, that maybe a lot of the issue is that people don't like a benefit when they're not also getting it. And so that's really why I think it's worth it to have a bigger tent to have the same benefit going to very low income families as well as middle class families, even upper middle class families, because it becomes more politically stable. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, one thing that 
was sort of recurring throughout all the presentations were these different words that I think that are both in our code of ethics as social workers, as well as just, you know, words that, that we use as social workers. So Luke uh, mentioned empowerment. Um, I heard agency, self-determination. We were, um, Aisha was talking about deservedness. Um, and um, specifically for, for, for um, Aisha and, and Joan, sort of interested in your thoughts on how social workers um, particularly could be involved in both um, advocacy on, on basic income, as well as even the, the, the implementation of, of a policy at, at a national level, right? So thinking through like, you know, if we do shift um, some of our welfare programs to basic income, what, what might that, um, what sort of role may, may social workers have in that? And so whoever, whoever would like to take a stab at that first. Sure, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. So I talk a lot about, you know, having been in the field for many, many years and not ever being part of something that is so directly tied to what people need, right? Being able to actually give folks what they need most and like uh, embodying our code of ethics in that delivery, I think is so crucial. And I think the importance of social workers in occupying this space specifically is tied to, I mean, some of what Aisha spoke about in terms of like the um, humiliation that folks deal with when they're seeking out traditional services. I give the one example here in Columbia County, our local department of social services has approximately 133 employees, zero social workers. So most people that are doing this type of uh, benefits delivery to folks are, you know, folks that are taking civil service, civil service exams that don't really have any, I mean, they might on some level uh, be committed to their work, but generally they don't have the same framework, the same code of eth ethics, the same understanding of sort of like from the macro to the micro, all the complex systems um, that folks are involved with. And so I think I'm kind of going off a little bit, but to answer that question, I think we have the ability as social workers to understand on the individual level and engaging in that way, how to advocate for this policy on a macro level and understanding how the, the intersections between the systems and the individuals uh, could really perpetuate that narrative. So yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's crucial for us to be here and to be amplifying um, our experiences with these programs. Definitely. Yeah, I'm going to add to what John said specifically as it relates to narrative. So one of my good friends, Ann Price, who runs the Insight Center um, out in California, always says that policy moves at the speed of narrative. And so I think that one of the good spaces for social workers who are those individuals who are hand in hand with what's happening um, in community in a very real way is the narrative shifts that are needed to align values so that individuals truly understand what poverty looks like in this country. I think one of the biggest lessons for me that I've learned in doing this work um, is that folks are woefully confused uh, about what poverty looks like and how precarious most individuals' financial situation is. So. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, so we, um, we have another question that's kind of a, um, a different, broader question, but um, in what ways can uh, basic income or guaranteed income interface with ecological movements? So thinking, is there, is there a way to target the benefits to communities most affected by global climate change um, and lo um, local population from, from production? Interested if anyone has any, any specific thoughts on that. Um, you know, thinking about obviously um, that these issues of inequality um, are also spatial. Um, there's also, a, um, you know, accumulated um, disadvantage, um, particularly for, um, racialized um, um, communities as well. Um, anybody have any thoughts on how this may intersect with that? I, I think Dylan, the one thing I can say very quickly is um, as we experience more sort of major climate um, events, especially on the Eastern seaboard, sort of floods and hurricanes on the Eastern seaboard, um, fires on the western side of the country. Uh, our policies, our safety net, quote unquote, that's sort of set up to help 
people who have been dislocated, um, their homes have been flooded, um, are typify everything that um, folks today have been talking about. They don't serve folks who are low income. They don't serve folks who are um, who uh, don't have clear title to their home because it's been passed down over generation to generation. Um, and so you actually see after natural disasters, a split between higher income folks are more likely to get help from an agency like FEMA or HUD. Um, and lower income folks are more likely to wait for a long time or be, be denied for a variety of reasons. And so there is an interesting question of whether or not uh, we need to fix those systems, I think. But there's also a question of whether or not cash transfers during that period could be a response uh, to all families who are receiving, who have been negatively affected by a flood. Can I add to that, Dylan? Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So some uh, basic income advocates support it because it could potentially lead to negative growth. So a lot of people who um, are in the ecological movement are worried about the fact that in capitalism, in, in order to, you know, hypothetically continue lifting all boats, which we know it doesn't, we have to continue to grow um, the economy, which means we have to grow, and grow consumption, we have, which means we have to grow manufacturing. So, so some basic income advocates see basic income as a way to create an income floor uh, for everyone without depending on constant growth in our economy and waste um, and, and uh, with detriments to the environment. Um, I wrote something on this question a long time ago, um, so I will. Um, I guess I can leave that, give that to somebody. Maybe that can be made. I don't know, made available somehow. I don't know, but um, but it's it's unclear whether or not basic income or guaranteed guaranteed income would be good <laughs> for the ecology, if you will, or bad. It would it would depend on how they're structured. Um, I have a a good friend who's a philosopher, who is she's a basic income sympathizer. But she's not completely sold, um, and she's in a, she's very much into conservation and ecology, and she worries that it will just reinforce growth. I mean, some some people do say it could lead to degrowth. She's worried that it could lead to growth, like sort of like you know runaway growth and things like that in consumption, and and so I, I don't know which way it would go, um, um, it, but I think it could go either way, right? Um, it would depend on how it's structured, things like that, and what other policies are part of the context of within which a basic income is implemented, or guaranteed income, I think. It's, it's my job, unfortunately, to intervene. Thank you so much. And I think for a final comment, Michael, that uh, reminds us that we have a lot to work on still and ask questions about. Um, but we are coming to the end of our time. And uh, there's one final poll. Uh, question and then just a couple of items at the end. So if people could do the final poll question here. Okay, and uh, can we see what results we got? Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad people uh, found this a learning experience. I certainly did. And I can't thank our panelists and uh, presenters enough. This was really terrific. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any, uh, if you want to be, uh, get more information on the grand challenges, get more involved in this kind of work, I'm just putting my um, email in the uh, chat and please be in touch. Uh, we hope also to be uh, uh, in touch with all of you uh, as other occasions come up. And there is also a couple of items uh, provided by some of our presenters of future reading for you to do. And uh, there will be a distributed, distributed and evaluation to CE participants uh, 
within a couple of days. So watch for that. You can see that message in the chat. So again, thank you for joining us in learning about, thinking about, and hopefully moving forward on these really important issues uh, for our time and into the future. Uh, and with that, I have to say goodbye. Thank you very much again.